Please turn in your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're going to look at just one verse this morning, John 3, 16, but I'd like to read verses 14 through 21 to give us a bit of context this morning. So John 3, verses 14 through 21. <clears throat> this is God's Word. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. Our verse this morning, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is God's Word. Please be seated. The story of John 3 is a conversation that Jesus has with a well-known religious leader named Nicodemus. He's known in the area. Jesus calls him the teacher of Israel, and their conversation centers around uh, the nature of salvation. How is a person saved? How is a person made right with God? Uh, Brenda and I have just finished watching the eight-episode series called The Chosen, and it's about the life of Christ and seen through the eyes of those around Him. It's really well done. If you've not watched it, I'd encourage you to download the app and and watch, uh, watch that series. Episode 7 in the series, next to the last one, deals with this conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus and kind of uh, speculates what Nicodemus must have been thinking. It's a fascinating exchange, and, and, uh, and in that episode, Jesus is pointing not to a new form of religion that he's ushering in, but he's pointing people to himself. And that's what John 3, 16 is all about. Uh, Martin Luther called this one verse, the Bible in miniature. And millions can quote it. It's one of, if not the most recognizable verse in all of Scripture. Uh, but if, even though millions can quote it, while it's well known, it's not altogether well understood. I like what A.W. Pink says in his book, The Attributes of God. He says, there are many today who talk about the love of God, but who are total strangers to the God of love. May that not be uh, true of us today. Uh, the world more than ever needs God's love spread from shore to shore. The two verses in the epistle of 1 John, uh, before the confession that we had this morning, or verses 7 and 8, and, and they say this, listen to how God's Word is framed, uh, His love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Notice how our love for others flows from the love of God for us. And it states that God is love. Now, this is stating one of God's great attributes. And it's stating something that is true of God, but not all of God. It's uh, stating one of His great, if not most glorious attributes of our Heavenly Father. Lately, uh, Brenda and I have been bemoaning the fact that, we've, uh, that we're getting older. There are a lot more aches and pains in trying to do things. Oh, oh, to be young again. And I came across this quote by Charles Spurgeon to that point, the great Baptist preacher. He says, be children again. And I think that sounds great. I'd like to go back to the uh, health of, of a child. But he uses it in a spiritual way. And this is what Spurgeon goes on to say. He says, be children again. 
You who have long loved your Savior and your Lord, take up your spelling book again and learn your ABCs again. Learn again that God so loved the world that He gave His Son to die that men and women may live through Him. May God cause us in childlike wonder once again to fall in love with the God of love. We're going to look at this one verse this morning. It's a simple outline. Uh, we're going to look at the depth of God's love, the breadth of God's love, the proof of God's love, and then the power of God's love. This first phrase, for God so loved, teaches us about the depth of God's love. God not only loves us or loved us, but He so loved us. This little word, this tiny word, so, explains something enormous, and that is the unfathomable depth of God's love. It is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable just like God Himself. I'm reminded of the words of that great hymn that we sing, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling like a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, love of every, love the best. Or as we sang this morning, love divine, all loves excelling. Everything God does, He does in love. Nothing is separate from or contradictory to the love of God. The whole Bible declares this and declares God's love. We did it in our, uh, Bruce did in the invocation, in our confession. The psalmist says over and over again things like, uh, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And the Apostle Paul says that love never fails. He says it never ends. We as believers can easily take for granted the love of God. We don't do it purposefully. It's just that we've heard about His love for so long that we forget that it is exactly what we long for. It's what we need. And we need to develop again that wonder of a little child, as Spurgeon said, that finds our joy and happiness in the love of God, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free. I am sure that if we de dwelt on the deep love of Jesus more, we would find much deeper joy, much deeper comfort, much deeper peace and hope in our lives. We also see that God's love is not only deep, but it is wide. The breadth of God's love is seen in this word, world. I love J.C. Ryle's three-volume commentary on um, commentaries on, on the book of John. I used it years ago to develop a curriculum for our, for our youth. It's fantastic. And he explains this idea of God's love for the world. And he says it this way. He says, the true view of the words, God so loved the world, I believe, means this. It means that the world is the whole human race of mankind, both saints and sinners without exception. In other words, he says that God so loved the world means the whole world of saints and sinners. And this is important for us to remember because sometimes in reform circles, we hear that God uh, does not love anyone but His own people, His elect. And J.C. Ryle addresses this further, and he continues. He says, it is a love unquestionably distinct and separate from the separate love which God regards for His saints. But it is a real love nonetheless. I love that. You see what he's saying? We can understand that there's, there's different depths uh, of love. I can love all children, but I love my children best and deeper. And in a similar way, God loves His own people in the deepest way. But His love for all mankind is far more deeper than we could ever imagine and wide. It is deep and wide. And what's really astounding is what we all know, and that is that the Bible teaches that God's love for us is not based on anything in us. Nothing in us would attract God to us. 
nothing in us. As a matter of fact, everything in us would really uh, repulse God, would repel Him from us. He is holy. We are sinful, evil, and depraved. That's what makes His love so incomprehensible is that He loves us that deeply in spite of the fact that we're this flawed and sinful. The unbelieving world rejects the truth of God's love. Critics and despisers of Christianity often point to the problem of evil in this world. And yet God desires even the salvation of those very ones who despise Him. It says in 1 Timothy 2, 4, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the heart of God, even for the lost. Take, for instance, the atheist Sam Harris in his book, uh, Letter to a Christian Nation. He says that the problem uh, of evil in this world is the old theodicy problem. A, A theodicy is a justification of God's goodness and love in the presence of unspeakable evil. And it usually is formulated like this, And that is, if God is all loving, then He would want to wipe out all evil. And if God is all powerful, then He could wipe out all evil. But evil still exists. Therefore, God is not all loving and not all powerful. You see, it's a common uh, objection to Christianity. Sam Harris goes on to explain it this way. He says, statistics show us that every few hours, uh, at least every few days, A child is abducted, tortured, and murdered. And he says, it goes on to say that the statistics that tell us that also tell us that that the same parents of that child believe in an all-powerful and an all-loving God watching over them. And Sam Harris asks, are they right to believe this? He says, is it good to believe this? And he says, no, no. He says, the murder of one single child, even once in a million years, casts doubt upon the idea that God is loving and all-powerful. But does it? Does it cast doubt? God's Word says that He waits patiently for the repentance of the most evil people in this world, even those who despise Him, like, like Mr. Harris, that if just one person in this world deserving of hell repents and turns, all of heaven rejoices, and it shows the unbelievable love of God. If God were to wipe out the whole, if God were to wipe out all the evil in this world, He would wipe out right now every Sam Harris, every Benny Parks, every human being everything in this world, but he doesn't. Certainly we can agree with with Sam Harris that the problem of evil is real. And if we just were to look at this world and what's going on in this world, we probably would not determine that there is an all-loving and all-powerful God. But God never tells us to look for proof of His love by looking at what's going on in His world. This world, which the Bible says, lies in the power of the evil one. No, he says, the proof is found not in this evil fallen world, but in the one person who came to save men and women out of this evil fallen world because he loved them. And this is the proof of his love. And it's our third point, the phrase that we see, the proof of God's love is that he gave his only son. If you've ever been in a Sunday school class where I've taught 1 Corinthians 13, which is about God's love and how it's to transform us and change us and affect our relationships, then you've heard me give this example. Early in our first year of marriage, I mean, just a few months into our marriage, I was running to work, running down the steps, about to go out the door, and I said, as I always do, bye, Brenda, I love you. And I heard nothing. I thought she, I must not have said it loud enough. She was in the kitchen. So I'm about to go out the door. I said, bye, Brenda, I love you. And right as I'm about to leave, I hear, huh. Now, guys, if you've never been married or you're newly married, that huh is not a good sign. It's not meaning, huh, I know that. That's awesome. It was, huh. 
And then I wanted to act like I didn't hear that huh and keep going, but I paused for a minute. She said, ha, you say you love me, but you don't show it. And I closed the door back and walked into the kitchen and we, we talked a little bit. You see, it was, uh, it was just a few months that we'd been married, April the 11th, 1987, and just six months before that, so less than a year, six months before that, I got on my knee and I promised I said, because I so loved Brenda, I gave her my one and only diamond ring, the only one I've ever bought and the only one I've ever given. I gave it to her and I said, if you will trust me, I will love you for the rest of our lives and I will never, ever, ever leave you. Now, I think that meant a lot to her right then. That meant a whole lot to her. I'm going to always love her and I'm never going to leave her. And now fast forward just several months, we're married and she's thinking, I'm stuck with this guy the rest of my life. He's never going to leave me. And he says he loves me, but he doesn't show it. Now we worked through that crisis and we've been married 33 years, so praise the Lord for that. But it does illustrate something very important and that is that we as humans are takers. We want what we want and we think we deserve to get what we want whenever. One of my close friends uh, kept sending me texts and, and, and emails, and he would, he would say, hey, Freddie. And he kept saying, hey, Freddie, and, uh, and, and titling Freddie. So finally I said, hey, why do you keep calling me Freddie? He said, Freddie the Freeloader. Now, for you people my age and older, you'll remember that Freddie the Freeloader was a, was a character that Re the comedian Red Skelton played on TV, Freddie the Freeloader. He's always getting stuff free. And so my friend said that, and he also sent me pictures of that Geico commercial alligator with the alligator arms where he's trying to reach over, acting like he's going to pay for everybody's meal. And my friend was saying, you've worked a lot harder to be the one to not have to pay for things when we're together. We're both pastors, and so I guess he thinks I work harder to do that. I think it was all in fun. Uh, when he says things like that, but I know that it's just simply to, an illustration of we all are takers in different ways. On a more serious note, to illustrate that, I, like you, have been struck by the vitriolic hatred and debate and division that's going on in our country over so many things. One thing that we all have in common, all of us, whichever side we're on, is we all think we're right. We all think that we're the ones that are right and accurate in these things. And we all want uh, and believe that what we deem is right, we deserve to receive. And that's because at some level, we're all takers. We all think we're the most virtuous, certainly way more virtuous than those who are on the opposite side of us. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not in any way suggesting that there aren't some things that are more virtuous and some things that are more right or wrong and wrong. I'm just making the point that in many ways we are all takers. We want what we want, but God is a giver. God is a great giver, and He so loved us that He didn't give us a token diamond ring. He gave His only Son. In John Stott's great book, The Cross of Christ, he has a section titled, The Holy Love of God. And in that, he quotes Dutch theologian G.C. Burkhauer, who writes this. He says, in the cross of Christ, God's justice and love are simultaneously revealed. You see, it's in the cross of Christ that God's love and His justice kiss each other. God's justice demands that we are perfect. Jesus said, you must be perfect like your heavenly Father. He says that anyone who does not keep everything in the law has a curse upon him. But his word tells us that Jesus lived a perfect life. He fulfilled righteousness perfectly, and he actually became a curse for us, and he endured the wrath of God that we deserve for our sins. He took upon our sins on himself upon the cross. We've done a musical here uh, many times at Briarwood over the years called Savior. One of my favorite songs in that musical is A Cross of Love. And my favorite line in that song is, this must be a cross of love for God to bruise his only son, which comes from Isaiah 53. It must be a cross of love for God to bruise His only Son. The cross is God's ultimate 
demonstration and proof of God's love for us. I love what A.W. Pink says. He says, whenever you are tempted to doubt God's love, he says, Christian reader, go back to Calvary. Go back to Calvary. You know, our love can be strong when people uh, receive it well, when we love others and they receive that well, when, when they receive our loving good intentions instead of our terrible actions, when we give love to people and they, they receive what we meant to do, not what we actually did. That, that's great. And then when somebody reciprocates and shows love to us, then our love becomes stronger. Not so with God. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us. Think about, think about the cross, what was going on at the cross. You had mockers sneering. You had haters spitting. You had disciples weeping. You had a thief hoping. And you had Jesus Christ loving all of them all the way. Remember our confession earlier, 1 John 4, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. He died the death that we deserve, the atoning death. That's the proof of God's love. Finally, we see the power of God's love, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Go back to the beginning of the uh, story in, in John 3, the story of Nicodemus. And right before this section, it says that as the, uh, as the, the, the snake was lifted up on the, on the pole, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And he tells Nicodemus this. And, and that represented back when Moses held up the, the, the bronze snake, it represented what we know in this passage, the death of Christ and him being lifted up. It was him becoming sin for us. It was him also being the satisfaction of sin for us. It's the terrible and glorious truth in one of salvation by atonement through Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God. Michael Horton in his book, In the Face of God, he talks about our desire to see God. He says, Do you, would, you, would you love to see God in all of his glory and splendor. Wouldn't you love that? He says, would you, would you really love to see the eternal God in all of his glory and splendor? He says, look to the blood-stained cross. Look to the blood-stained cross with flies and splinters, with mockers, angry, and with the Father forsaking the Son. Forsaking the son. He says, it, it doesn't seem like a display of divine power and glory. He said, it seems like divine weakness and failure. But he says, yet everyone who looks upon this son, represented by the bronze snake, everyone who looks upon this son is saved from sin's guilt and tyranny. Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? Now, I want to briefly discuss perishing before believing in this section. Will not perish, but have eternal life. People perish. There is an eternal destination waiting each one of us, either eternal destruction or eternal life. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, in his book, Charity and Its Fruits, his commentary on, and sermons on 1 Corinthians 13, if you've ever heard my, uh, my series on that in Sunday school, uh, the last chapter of that book is my favorite. It's called Heaven, a World of Love, of God's love that lasts forever. But he also has a section in there over several pages that he calls Hell, a World of Hatred, where there is no love, where there is no care for one another, there is no partying. It's a, it's a world of hatred. And J.C. Ryle makes this sobering comment about the perishing of people. He says, there will, be a day, uh, there will be a day to come when those who have not been born again will wish that they had never been born at all. There will be a day of perishing. Now, some of you know that I love Pilgrim's Progress. 
It's one of my favorite books. If you're not read it, you should read it. I'm going to give you a spoiler warning, a uh, spoiler alert. I'm going to tell you the end of the book. That's a dangerous thing to do. But, at, uh, but one of my favorite characters, the, one of the funniest characters in Pilgrim's Progress and most tragic is the character Ignorance. And you meet ignorance early in the book, and he, his problem is he's ignorant of salvation. He thinks he's good enough. He thinks if there's a God, God will accept him because he's good enough. He didn't need to come in through the way. And Christian and Hopeful, the main characters, are talking to him, and then they leave him for a while, and they see a lot of things. And one thing they see is a, a huge mountain, and it has a door in the side of it. They don't know what that means, but it has a door in the side of it, and whenever that door was open, they're screaming and yelling and wailing. And they don't know what that's about, but they go through their journey as pilgrims. And when they come to the river of death where they die, it's a tough time for Christian. He has a difficult time getting over the river. But they make it over, and two shining ones usher them into heaven. Close the door. It's a beautiful picture. And you think that's the end of the book. That would be the telling book as he reaches the celestial city. He left the city of destruction, as we talk about in John 3, and he reaches the, the celestial city. You think it's the end. And you turn the page and you hear about ignorance. It says ignorance is in a, a little boat paddling easily over death, representing death, over to the other side. And this is how the book ends. He walks up to the door to the gate and it says, when they told the king that ignorance was out there, when they told him that Christian and Hopeful were there, the king rushed down, said, enter into my glory. It says, when they told the king he would not come down to see ignorance, but instead commanded the two shining ones who had conducted Christian and hopeful into the city to bind ignorance hand and foot and take him away. Then they picked up ignorance and carried him through the air to the door that I had seen in the side of the hill earlier. He says, then I saw that there was a way. They opened it up and threw him in. He says, then I saw that there was a way to hell, even from the very gates of heaven, as well as from the city of destruction. And then he said, so I awoke, and it was a dream. And that's the end of the book. But you see, what Bunyan wrote using the similitude of a dream is in fact reality. There are many, thousands of people like ignorance who just think that they're good enough and that God will accept them in the end. They've lived a good life. But that's not true. It's only whoever believes. But isn't that a great word? Whoever believes has eternal life. What a great word. No one has to perish. Anyone, whosoever believes, will enter into the celestial city, the gates of heaven. Years ago, we took a group of high school students to England to work right outside of London in a working class area with my good friend Colin Phillips, who was a Baptist pastor there. And uh, he, he labored uh, faithfully for 25 years. And we had a Bible club this week, and a lot of kids came. And there were three kids that I got to know that lived in the neighborhood that, that Colin really loved. They wreaked havoc. Uh, in that community and in Collins Church. I mean, he, one of them uh, threw a brick at him while he was preaching in his pul pulpit. And then they would climb, they had bars on the outside of the windows, and every Sunday they would climb up, shake, yell, cuss. And these were little kids, like they were 10 years old. But I met Darren and Leon and Raymond. And so they loved McDonald's. So I said, if you come every day to the, uh, to the, the Bible club, I'll bring you a sack of McDonald's at the end of the week. Well, Leon would have none of it. I'm sorry, Darren would have none of it. He just said, no, not coming, don't want it. I love McDonald's, but I'm not coming. He never came, missed out. Uh, Leon was a little kid I got to know. I loved him. He was great, and, and uh, he came every day, and he believed me. Mr. Benny, I, I can't wait till Friday. And so he came, and he ate two or three McDonald's hamburgers. I had a whole sack full of them in just a brown paper sack sitting over there. Raymond was the interesting one. Raymond... He kept doubting. He, he said, I, I want to come. He would come back, but even in the last day, he just could not come to grips with, am I really going to have hamburgers? And I, I pointed through a window, and I said, at the end of the day, you'll, you'll get these. And I pointed to the brown sack, and he said, I don't believe that there are burgers in there. I said, there are. I said, I said I'm telling you, Raymond, I said, as sure as there is a God in heaven who loves you dearly, there are 10 hamburgers in that bag over there. 
if you come back. And he doubted. He went back and forth. He, and, and he said to me, if you're lying, I'll kill you. And I believed it. He was only 10 years old, but I believed it. I said, I'm not lying. As sure as there's a God in heaven, there are 10 hamburgers in it. And he came back, and he finally ate them, and he loved it. And it was a great day. And I felt like he was doubting Thomas. I wanted to say, put your hand in that bag. Just like Jesus said, put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and stop doubting and believe. That's the power of his love. That he fills the hearts, our hearts with love and gives us peace. And it's all with the exercise of one little word, believe. Whoever believes. I love the song in conclusion that we sing often and it's called the deep, deep love, uh, how deep the Father's love for us. I almost used it as our outline. How deep the Father's love for us, that's for God so loved. Vast beyond all measure, that's the breadth of God's love. That he would give his only son, he gave his only son, and then to make a wretch his treasure. Whoever believes in him should not perish. You see, people perish because they're wretches. But Jesus loves to wash wretches and adopt us into his family. He loves to change foes into friends and traitors into treasures. That's his love for us. Why don't people believe this? It says in the book of Isaiah about Jesus, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Why don't people believe the message of God's love? It's not because as the atheists Sam, Hitchin, uh, Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens and Bertrand Russell have said and many others, because there's not enough evidence. That's not why people don't believe. This passage tells us the reason people don't believe is they love their sins too much and they're not willing to part with them. They're not rendered, uh, willing to surrender to Jesus as Savior and Lord. They want the right to reign and rule their own lives and not renounce that. They reject the whosoever believes and continue to believe in themselves. They love the world, and it's hard to part with the world. They love the world. Their, their version of this statement would not be what we just read, but their version would be something like this. For men so loved the world that they gave up on God's Son, believing that they would not perish but still have eternal life. It's the, it's the pride of man. It's tough to part with this world. Those who are lost stumble over Christ. The scripture says, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. And people stumble over him all the time. But that passage goes on to say, Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Repent. Believe today. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, don't believe the father of lies any longer. That tries to keep you from this incredible truth. Come to him today. Watch him love you and change you more than you could ever imagine. And trust him. Believe and live forever. It simply requires believing. We say repentance and faith, but that's because they're two sides of the same coin. In believing, we're turning to Christ. You can't turn to Christ without turning from your sins and all efforts to save yourself by your good works. That's repentance and faith. You turn to Christ. And I would challenge you and encourage you, if you don't know Jesus, today, stop doubting and believe. Let us pray. If you've never come to Christ, I invite you today to say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I recognize that I have not trusted you. I have not followed you. I have turned away from you, but I'm turning to you now. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and make me the person that you would have me to be. And Father, for your children here today, let us once again be amazed by your divine love and let us be strengthened by it. And Father, let us go tell someone this week that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen.